So it was striking to me, long before I'd ever heard of David, Simon, and Eric Overmeyer, they come with this idea, with these characters, who are the archetypes of what makes New Orleans distinct. Because in trying to tell the story of this city, these are the eyes through which you need to see it. Hi, folks. Thank you very much for coming out tonight. Uh, Treme, which we are here to celebrate, is an extraordinary American television series that is entering the final leg of its existence. There's five more episodes to go. Uh, there's another one airing on Sunday. The final episode is the 29th of December. I've seen all five. If you're in this room, you're probably going to watch them anyway, but I've got to say, watch them. <laughs> watch them. Watch them live. Watch them with people who like the show. You won't regret it. Uh, we have a wonderful panel here tonight to talk about uh, Treme in general, but also specifically the role of food on the show, and it is a very important role that it plays, as important as music and as important as politics. And the occasion is uh, the publication of this book, Treme, Stories and Recipes from the Heart of New Orleans, by Lolas Eric Eli, who is with us tonight. And I want to begin by reading a section from uh, the foreword to the book which I think is apropos and hopefully will set the tone. Like very few other great cities around the world, the price of admission to New Orleans, what qualifies one for citizenship, so to speak, is simply a deep and abiding love for the place, a need to live there no matter what. What unites the characters on the show Treme is that same love for a place, an attitude, a culture, where delicious food and great music are birthrights. You could, I suggest, say many similar things about professional cooks, also a subculture with a tendency to attract misfits, the mad, passionate, refugees, fugitives, seekers, and sensualists. They could survive in no other industry. Unique for television, this is a show about people making things, and not just thing things, but intangible things. It's about the creative process and about what it takes and how it happens that certain people make beautiful music or delicious food and others can't. It's about the cost of trying to do those things, the difficulty and the obstacles, how undervalued a thing like culture can be in a world where an entire city is allowed to drown in slow motion on national television while its leaders do nothing. That's uh, actually a pretty good uh, uh, summary of what Treme is about, and I always hate that question, what is the show about, because a great show can't be answered in one line when you ask that. Uh, but uh, that's uh, from the forward by Anthony Bourdain. Um, I want to bring out our panel now. Uh, first, uh, Nina Noble, executive producer. Nina, you there? <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Lolas Eric Eli, the story editor for Treme and the author of this cookbook. And last but certainly not least, David Simon, the co-creator of Treme with Eric Overmeyer. Okay. I hope the uh, audio is working for all of us here. Uh, I guess I want to begin by asking a really mundane question. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, a really mundane question, but one that just started fascinating me as I rewatched episodes of the show. When, when you've got 20, 30, 40 people in a room and they're eating this delicious food, uh, are they really eating that food? What is it like? Like, what, do you, what, you know, what does it mean to feed people fictionally? <laughs> um, this is a better question for Nina, but I will answer by saying we do tell the extras when we're establishing that master shot on the first take, you know, don't be putting more than a bite or two in your mouth because, you know, by about take eight or nine, you're going to be sick of what you're eating. <laughs> we, we try to warn them. Sometimes people get locked into the, the repetitive act of eating, and it can be disastrous. Mm. That's nice of you. The prop guys say, don't eat the food. <laughs> don't eat the food. We're not rolling. It's rehearsal. Is the food, when, more we see, when we see food in a close-up, it's like when it, Treme specializes in these. They're very brief. They don't, they're not ostentatious, but close-ups of the food that make the audience go, ah. Oh. Is that food edible? 
Well, let me say the food was a new thing for us, I guess, and for HBO in terms of dealing with food in this way, in the same way as the music. And so um, we really had to get our directors to, to film a little bit differently and to show the food and not do, you know, specifically food shots, but we wanted to see the food, which is not a natural thing for filmmakers. So, um, so, so we had to learn that, that whole process. Um, the food is real. We don't really know how to do things with fake food. I think some people do, but we never learned that. Um, so uh, all the food's real. It was all, we had a food stylist on the show, artistic director, uh, Zoe Davies, who designed a lot of the menus that you see. Um, and there was, and there was a transitions. I mean, we had six or seven restaurants, I guess, in the course of the, uh, of the show. And that was um, imp important to show De Sotel's journey through all those places, through the food. Is the other, oh, go ahead. Sorry. The other thing to keep in mind is we got these chefs on set making the food, either so and the other folks in the this hotel scenes, but also the chefs at the restaurants we shot at. And these chefs want people to be enthusiastic about the food. Imagine if all the actors saying, yeah, man, this tastes like some prop food here, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so they got some pride as well, even though it's not clear what it tastes like from the filming. After the, after the episode, we'd go back, particularly in this hotel in the third season, everybody would eat what was left over. And they want the attaboys like everybody else, you know? <laughs> so there's not a case where, you, where somebody's standing there going, don't eat that one. It's not like, because I, I know no. that some very pictorially minded filmmakers, they'll spray the food with gelatin to get it to look a certain way, and you don't do that. No, no we didn't get that far. We did replace the, the, the food, you know, when it was time for the, uh, the beauty so, shot, so to speak, I guess. So is it fair to say that then the attitude, I had always read, and correct me if I'm wrong about this, that the attitude towards the music on the show is you have a scene that is set in a club, you have musicians up on stage, they are real musicians, they're playing real instruments, and you're filming it, and that's it. And if they make mistakes, you know, if it mm -hmm. works for the scene, you leave it in. If the ambience in the room is off, you, you know, that's part of it. It's almost a documentary sort of attitude. Is that, is that more or less accurate? And, and if so, does that sort of apply to the food too? The way that I mean, shot? it is more or less accurate. We, they really were playing in the clubs, uh, the music. Uh, you know, you may reach a point at which you're getting some specific insert shot that's telling a story of a certain moment in which a show is being played. And you'll go back and you'll get you'll get that solo or you'll get, you know, you, you, might, you might pick up a piece from a different angle. But yeah, they're gonna play it again then. Um, and I think that may be comparable to what Nina was saying about sort of the, uh, the Mr. DeMille close-up of, of when the plate is finally ready to be exhibited of, you know. <laughs> well, well, just if you have, if you imagine a person standing at a counter and food and, you know, a typical camera shot would be from here up. Right. You know, so the first season, I, I think the first couple episodes, we had scenes where we never saw the food. Right. You know, and it's like, well, wait a minute. So one of the, the challenges was not only the real food, one of the challenges was really the choreography in the kitchen. Oh. Which was an astounding sure. feat. Um, you know, just figuring out where people have to move within the space and where they have to be to say certain lines and yet they have to be over here because that's where the crab is. And you know, there's a whole dance that people that work in kitchens know. Can, can we talk then generally about how, how that works? Because uh, this show, actually all of the shows that David Simon has been associated with have a reputation for being you know, not accurate to the point of being uh, undramatic, but as accurate as you can possibly be. Oh, undramatic. Is <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think but you're onto something there. In the sense that the details matter. The details matter. Like, it matters to you if a reporter's doing his job and a reporter can watch the show and go, yeah, that seems like what a reporter would do. But the, the same thing with the, with the cooking and the preparation of the food. When people are moving around the kitchen, there are some very elaborately choreographed scenes Absolutely. on the show. Yeah. Are, are you thinking about realism or are you thinking about the scene or how do you split the difference between those two well both i mean it it, it all has to work that's yeah. i guess that's that's the the beauty of it we had um a couple of actors handful of actors in every scene and then the rest were real people that worked in kitchens that came in on their day off to work with us right um so the challenge was as we've done in our other shows working with real non-actors you know, real craftsmen and actors in the same space and well, having them develop a common language. Right. We often had a, a very talented chef from New Orleans have to play um, somebody's victim. <laughs> I remember the scene Alain with Alain. Alain Shia. Alain Shia. Yeah. Alain Shia is an executive chef of Dominica and, you know, really 
talented guy and we had him play. There's a second season, we had a restaurant called Brulard, and that was our only fake restaurant, really, with an actor playing a chef. Right. Um, and so. This was the guy, the jerk, right? Yeah, this yeah. was this guy. The tower. That's why it was a fictional Excuse me, one, right? The genius jerk. The genius jerk, the genius. sorry, my mistake. Genius, but a jerk. <laughs> or a jerk, but a genius. <laughs> and, and this actor, want, and this was based on a real chef, I imagine. You know, oh, yeah. Tony, the, you know, <laughs> Only one. Uh, we won't use his right. name here in New York, but you all know him. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the hard thing there was we, we didn't want this character to yell and scream. He was so insidious that he, he wouldn't yell and scream. But it was an, the instinct of the actor to do that at times. Yes. You know, reading those lines. And, you know, the listen to your fish Listen to your scene, fish. Yes, right? yes, yes, yes. Um, yeah, that's the wax on, wax but, off. But there's, of there's the a moment scenes. where he's, uh, he's, he's torturing the, uh, the Poissonnet. Is that, is that who Alain played? I'm trying to yes, remember. Yes. He he's player. torturing. No, he was, in the, he was the grill man. Oh, he's the grill man. Yeah. No, no, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. talking about different scenes. There's the one where the squab is not cut, hadn't rested long enough to be cut. That's when Alain dealt with it. That's right. right. But then there's also where he's got the guy in the headlock and explains That's it. right, so that's the Poissonnet, yeah. But think about yeah. the acting involved in being a really good chef and be, having the pride in that. And then you go to work on this television show, and they're making you play the victim. <laughs> it was well, it was it was Jim McKay who was directing that yeah. that episode, and what and Jim went over to this guy and said, you know, he said, you really, um, you feel like you're helping the people that work for you, that it's your job to mentor them and to to share your wisdom and everything that you know from all these years with the people that work with you. Mm. And that's that's how we got listened to your fish. That that's a good the, that's a good note. Yeah, that was, that was the note. You know something else though. Part of what is so wonderful about the way that David and Eric conceived the show is that they understood the importance of culture in the concept of telling the New Orleans story, and in the broader sense, of the context of telling the American story. Yes. So, like you know, as you may have noticed, the show is not especially religious, but there's a moment in a lot of the food scenes where folks will say. Damn, red beans and rice, it ain't even Monday. Most shows, you don't even know what they're eating because it doesn't matter. Right. But here the sense is that this is part and parcel of what New Orleans is about, and it's part and parcel of what we're trying to celebrate and show in the context of the show as well. Well, that's, that's actually one thing I wanted to ask you about is the, the characters on the show often talk about the history of New Orleans, the music of New Orleans, and the food of New Orleans, and they do it in terms of ownership. And there often seems to be almost a degree of one-upsmanship that somebody will, a, a character who maybe hasn't been there that long will say, this is, this is the best gumbo I've ever had. And I'll say, you know what, this is all right, but you should try this other place. <laughs> and then somebody else will chime in and say, yeah, but this other place here behind the, the other place that you were talking about that no one knows about, that's the best place. And it, it, yeah. it's almost like, it, to, to the point where it becomes comical. Well, those are the documentary sections of the show. Yeah. <laughs> those are real conversations. I mean, yeah, so that's, so that's not an exaggeration. The, the self-awareness, or, or maybe lack of self-awareness, that New Orleans has about the arguments over authenticity. Yeah. Uh, are, it's, it's some of the most hilarious, internecine, you know, <laughs> fratricidal stuff you've ever heard. <laughs> and, and, you know, and, and New York has that too, but New York's a much bigger place, and... Not not everything seems staked on you know New York is 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 a city of immigrants and not everything's staked on the way you're you know whose grandmother lived in on what block and and what she put in her gumbo and, and in New Orleans it really you know New Orleans was a city where before the before Katrina seventy one percent of the people uh, who lived there were native that's an astonishing number for an American city you know yeah. we're such a tra uh, transitory people nomadic is what we are. And so, you know, a lot of people took that on the show as being like, you know, insider, hipster, but actually that's the way people in New Orleans reference their world. And it's really, you know, it's remarkable. It's what keeps the city being unique and at the same time it can be exhausting. It's conversational currency. Right, it can be exhausting if you're an outsider. and It can also be exhausting, you know, if you've, if you've only been there for five or 10 or, or 20 years. Yeah. You know, um, I don't. I don't know what the moment it was it would, with which it would, you you become a na native, but it's it's way out there on the horizon. You know, and and, yeah. <laughs> and and they take it very very seriously. And yeah. and in some ways, you know, you can laugh at it. And at times on the show, we did laugh at it, and we were we were you know our tongue was in our cheek. But 
you can laugh at it all you want, but it's what made New Orleans New Orleans and what keeps it New Orleans. Well, it seems a very deliberate kind of comparison being drawn, particularly in like this, the second half of season two and the first half of season three, where you've got a lot of heavy duty restaurant action. You've got, so I think the move to New York <laughs> happened somewhere around in there. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, and actually, you got two moves to New York. You got a musician character and a chef who are both going to New York and trying to find their fortune. And there's that sense of competition between New Orleans and New York, like an affinity, but also a competition in the sense of, you know, I've got to go to New York to truly make it, but also a feeling of a tremendous guilt at having left New Orleans. And, and, a feel, and, and people who have stayed in New Orleans or plan to go back, What's, feeling like you're not, right. you're not really authentic if you, if you leave. We're at the 92nd Y, so I'll ask this question. I forgot the Hebrew word, but what's the opposite of Aliyah? <laughs> Do you know? Is anybody here? No, 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 that's another Hebrew word, also with an A, which means, Aliyah means going up, going down. It's that Hebrew verb of when you leave Israel to go to the diaspora. Yeah. Um, that, the tonality of the, I mean, you, you read a blog now, uh, 10 years out of Katrina, about the people who didn't come back and there's, you know, there's Contem judgment. Contempt. No, judgment. Yeah. Judgment. I um, had an interesting circumstance in that regard last night. I see a friend of mine who I've known since childhood at dinner last night. He moved up here because he lost his house, lost his job, lost everything. Per perfectly reasonable. And yet. Well, at a point he says to me, man, you know, I always got the impression you kind of judged me for having left. I, you know, I mean, I, I wanted to stay. And I'm like, man, <laughs> you got to feed your family. I didn't, you know, I didn't yeah. judge you. But I guess there's that implication that, well, you know, I stayed. I don't know what the hell you did, but right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And then, again, that 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 sense of like almost an unconscious sort of competition of you know I was here the whole time. Yeah. Like maybe there's somebody who left for six months and right. they came back, but they're not as pure as the person who never left. Right. But I also say though, in the sort of couple of months right after the storm, in fact, when the show begins, there's a kind of sense among those people who were there, and I was among them at that point, of something very special. I'm driving through the French Quarter with a friend of mine, and she stops at a corner and says, look around. I'm like, yeah, okay. You will never see this again. You will never see Bourbon Street absolutely empty again. And there was something about a bonding that took place in the aftermath of that, which is the kind of thing we try to get a sense of in those early episodes. I mean, a big part of the early writer's room was trying to get a sense of what it felt like, even beyond the question of what exactly, what kind of plot points might make sense. Um, because that kind of feeling cemented people in a way that's been crucial moving forward. The, the, the idea of legacy applies in so many different ways on the show. There's the political and historical legacies in a general sense. There's the musical legacies. There's the legacies of food. Uh, you've got a number of recipes in this cookbook that uh, are tied to particular characters. Mm -hmm. and, and in some cases, these characters, if you haven't looked at this book yet, you really should. It's, it's kind of great. The, the characters uh, are introducing specific dishes and they're doing it in their own <laughs> voices. Uh, and they're reminding me of people on the show. Like, it sounds like somebody on the show is just appearing in the book and talking to you. And Davis McAlary is being Davis McAlary. And it's, it's, I've had so many friends like Davis McAlary that I don't know whether to hug him or punch him when I watch the show. <laughs> um, but but the, there are many times on the show where somebody will be eating something and they'll say, where, where, where is this from or what is the recipe? And they'll say, my grandmother made it or my father used to make this or this is from a restaurant that used to be in the neighborhood but closed. And can you talk about that a little bit, that sense of like food is almost a repository of history? Um, so if you think about the moments when you and your family are all together, when you and your cousin and the whole extended family are together, it's around those big meals around the holidays. And one of the things I do from time to time when I'm traveling is ask people, well, what would I have if I came to your house for Thanksgiving dinner? If you're having mashed potatoes, you're not from New Orleans. <laughs> but in that sense, these things are definitive. Part of what's happened and part of what we try to capture in the book is this idea of food as a crucial part of cultural identity. And obviously, that's handed down from generations. And I'll never forget, you know, here it is, I'm like, at that point, like 30 years old. And so I tell my aunts, you know, I'll, I'll be glad to cook something for Christmas dinner. It's like, baby, you cook the salad. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like sit at the kids table now. Yeah. Pretty, yeah. Yeah. You know, when I get to be 70, I assume they'll let me, you know, cook something. But there's that sense <laughs> right. of, of that history and the, the, nece the necessity of having studied and been a part of it yeah. to actually be able to contribute on another level. Can you tell me a little bit about your mother's gumbo? <laughs> um, it's a line I've used many times before and will use many times again. 
every boy in New Orleans is honor bound to say that his mother makes the best gumbo. <laughs> I am distinguished from the rest of them in that I am telling the truth. <laughs> um, this is journalism, people. Well, it's funny because, you know, Nina and I... It's just being empirical. <laughs> right, yeah. I did study. Nina and I talked a lot about maintaining the kind of, of fiction in the context of the book as we do on the show. We got these real characters playing with these actors, but the senses, we're trying to give a sense that this is all real. Um, and so my mother's gumbo appears as LaDonna's recipe. But one of the things that the fiction allowed me to do in this context was put these reflections I had in the mouths of the kinds of people who had said to me those kinds of things. Well, baby, you don't ever do that. That, you know, that will ruin your, your, <laughs> ruin your gumbo. Yeah. And so even though the, the, um, the history is coming through a fictional character, through Jeanette de Sartell or some of the other characters, yeah. that's all stuff that's been researched, all stuff that I went to the library and found and checked and double checked. Because just as the show attempts to be a reflection of what's actually happened and happening in the city, we wanted the book to be that as well. Dogma is a source of great comedy on the show. Like the more people are adamant <laughs> about their own particular way of doing things, the more, the, the more sort of objectively funny they seem to be. And the more agitated they get about the right way, the right way to cut something, the right way to spice something, the right way to play a solo, the, right, you know, the time to come in and the time to stay out. It's, it's funny. They turn into Daffy Duck, like when he's freaked out, like they get so angry. Well, you know, there's the Orthodox school of gumbo and the Reform school of gumbo. And they're constantly at war with each other. Explain, please. Well, my mother's Orthodox. Their mother people? They're Reform. <laughs> it's not their fault. Don't get them started on the Reconstruction stuff. <laughs> <laughs> they play folk guitars and stuff. <laughs> The, uh, I read an interview with you in the New Orleans Advocate where you, you, uh, somebody asked you about the show and you said the main character is a chef, <laughs> which uh, strictly speaking isn't really true. There's a character on the show who is a chef, but I, 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 I got a kick out of that because that to me spoke to the, the centrality of food in your universe. You know, suddenly I'm feeling like Charles Barkley who said of his autobiography he was misquoted in it. <laughs> <laughs> I do not remember that particular line, although I, I will steal it in the future. I always thought the main character was the junior writer from New Orleans who was trying to learn about television. You're, you're probably not wrong. Well, you know, food is very much a main character. People talk a lot about the city as being a main character. That's certainly true. But also, we look at the components of it, the politics, the music, and the food. Because my attitude about what makes New Orleans interesting is different. Is the, the food, the music, and the architecture. So it was striking to me, long before I'd ever heard of David Simon and Eric Overmeyer, they come with this idea, with these characters, who are the archetypes of what makes New Orleans distinct. Because in trying to tell the story of this city, these are the eyes through which you need to see it. The agitators and the dreamers, I well, guess. Well, if you're gonna do culture. If, yeah. if culture is gonna be the <clears throat> framework of the show, if that's what you're gonna discuss, then you need culture bearers. Um, you know, I mean, there's obviously, you know, there are dentists and actuaries and accountants and, and, and firefighters in New Orleans, just like anywhere else. Um, and not to say that there, can't, there couldn't be a straight up story about them, but that's not what Treme was about, so. No, you know. but you do have an interesting character, uh, David Hidalgo. Uh, the, 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 Nelson. Oh, sorry, Nelson. Nelson Hidalgo, sorry. From, from uh, the businessman from Texas who becomes very much, it's funny because on almost any other show, he would be the evil businessman, the evil soul-sucking businessman, but. Uh, he's the friendly soul-sucking businessman. He is, he's, he's an opportunity, in every crisis, an opportunity should be his motto, but he seems to genuinely love the food and genuinely love the music. And he's very humble, like as he's plotting his little deals, he's very humble about that when he's in the presence of a meal that he can't get enough of. You know, it, when the, uh, I'm, I think I'm trying to remember the film that I saw it in. There was a great line. Oh, at Broadcast News. There was a wonderful line about what did you think the devil would look like? <laughs> Horns and a pitchfork. I mean, you know, he's, he's, he's a human being like anyone else, but disaster capitalism is what it is. And Naomi Klein got that right. You know, in every disaster is a uh, grand and, and venal opportunity. And yet there's a, there's a sort of a, I don't want to call it hopeful exactly, but a sort of a, a resigned, pragmatic, skeptical attitude towards that sort of thing. At least I sensed that 
in this final run of episodes, the idea that things are changing and maybe raging against the dying of the light will only get you so far. Um, no, I think it's a good thing to rage against the dying of the light. I don't want to. I don't want to short sell raging against the dying of the light. Yeah. Um, but they don't seem as angry though. These characters. Well, I think what you witnessed is, you know, what was really fascinating to me is when the show first emerged. We were coming in three months after the storm. People were incredibly traumatized. The city had based you know, PTSD, and some of the most vociferous resentments uh, that we encountered on the part of, uh, of some critics came out of New York. I'll say this. A and a sense of, why are people so angry? And it was, it was so unself-aware of New York because the rest of the country was very much with New York after 9-1-1. Right. And had some sense of, you know, what you guys have been through has been, was so visceral and, 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 and emotionally overwhelming that you know, we, we sort of understood the, um, you know, how this, this was such a central element. To, you know, it, it was what was being, you know, it, it had to go round and round in everybody's head. Um, well, New Orleans lost 80% of its physical structure. And, um, the, you know, if you went down there after, in, in the weeks and months afterwards, people were really, really hurt and wounded and felt very alone. And, the, and, and what had just happened to them was all they could talk about and, 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 and viscerally. And so to see, like, in the pages of the Atlantic, this sort of, like, get over yourself, it was astonishing. It really was, because, you know, it wasn't, you know, this is the way people were down there in the immediate aftermath. Well, these, these episodes are now four years later, and certain things didn't happen to New Orleans that everybody feared, mm -hmm. and some things did happen that were regrettable, and, but, but people were coming to terms with what, their, what the range of their futures were. So, yeah, I mean, I hope you've seen an emotional progression on the part of the characters that, that was intended. Speaking of every crisis and opportunity, there's, there's this uh, sense in which the, the flood and the aftermath of the flood is presented as a huge trauma, a huge collect, like an umbrella trauma that sort of covers over everybody else. But within that, there are characters going through these individual traumas, like the, lo you know, the loss of a job, the suicide of somebody in their family, a rape, so forth. And these are things that don't have anything specifically to do with the flood. These are things that might or might not have happened anyway. And um, the idea of picking up and carrying on and being um, attentive to the damage that's done but not overwhelmed by it seems a very important part of the show. And when that happens, what do you cling to? You cling to the familiar things like food. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and food seems a tremendously comforting thing uh, all through the show, but particularly, I don't know why, but maybe it almost felt like the food was more keenly spotlighted in this last run of episodes. I don't want to give anything away, but there's a, a moment involving fried chicken in the episode that's airing on Sunday that's quite something quite something. I mean, like, I, I didn't expect that fried chicken could be as piercing as it is in this scene. It's only a couple of lines. It's only a couple of lines. Hmm. Do, you have, do, do you have those kinds of associations with food, or do you have those sort of Madeleine kind of feelings that, like, ah, yes, I feel better now that I'm eating this? Well, one of the things that distinguishes New Orleans from most other places is the idea of having a couple of dishes that are emblematic of the city. And I remember uh, Hurricane Katrina struck on a Monday, August 29th, 2005. One week from then, um, me and a whole lot of other folks who were in Baton Rouge got together on a Monday, um, and we served red beans and rice. What other dish, we served red beans and rice. What other dish and what other city could you serve and immediately say, this is our food, this is our community, right. this is us? Right. And so we're always aware of that. Um, and I think that's, that is an example of why food was crucial to this show. There's, another, there's a moment in the book where um, Joanne Clevenger, actually it's an essay ostensibly by uh, Creighton Burnett, mm -hmm. but he's quoting something that Joanne Clevenger actually told me in an interview where she said, well, the word restaurant comes from a Latin word for restore. And the idea really was that restaurants were restorative, et cetera, et cetera. And particularly in those days after the storm, people did not have kitchens. Restaurants were about getting some food. It was also about seeing who was there. It was about a touchstone of what was familiar. And it was about a community um, when you had relatively little community. And so all of that kind of thing informs the show 
even when, here we are four years later, and it's not at the, the heart of the plot, but it's always uh, implied in what we're doing. You have to wonder sometimes how many of the decisions made by the characters are, uh, like, in the way that previous generations made decisions based on what had happened to them during the Depression. Mm -hmm. Like, the way things mm -hmm. like that alter your behavior as you move forward. Is there a, um, uh, is there any particular uh, uh, moment on the show uh, in, that, that has to do with food that you individually would like to spotlight that you thought, yes, we got it right? Take a picture of that shit, my friends. Yeah. In the yeah. first season, when she, when she uh, is in her element and she's cooking hard and, and it's, it's coming out well and she puts the shrimp dish and the and the and the, the shrimp, she's got them sort of perched so that they seem to be praying on the top of the, <laughs> of the etouffee, and uh, and she leaves it off, you know, for the for the waitress to pick up, and says, she just stands back and she says, take a picture of that shit, my friends, <laughs> and, and it, the the pride of of, um, you know, it it, it was uh, it defined the character for me, it defined what you know. Um, one of the things Tony Bourdain, uh, who deserves an awful lot of credit for coming in and giving us a lot of the banter in the kitchens, and um, one of the things he, he really impressed upon us when we started designing the show was um, what you give up in order to become a chef at the highest level. It's a sort of the normalcy of life you give up in order to be in a kitchen six days a week and, um, and, and the amount of time and prep and, and, and finding the right foods and you know, threading the needle every night to, to, to get service out, and it's exhausting. They're and, working longer hours than any CEO, aren't they? Yeah, and, and, and it, you know, the, so the, the gratifications have to be there. And one of the things, let's face it, that we don't have on the show is you can't taste the food, you know? You can hear the music, you know, you can look at the scenery, you can look at the architecture, but the food is, is must remain without that, the, the fundamental dim dimension of taste. Yeah. And, um, you know, we tried to figure out a way that HBO On Demand could get you bread pudding <laughs> when you saw bread pudding. But, you know, on a, co on a cost per viewer basis, it was, <laughs> it was said to be problematic. I think they were just cheap. But, um, but, but that, you know, so that was a moment where I thought we transcended that, that barrier of, you know, she puts it up there and just the look on, on, on Kim's face, which she delivered is in character is just. I um, one thing I want to go back to from the the previous question about um, New Orleans coming back and the food. Tom Fitz Fitzmaurice, um, local journalist and and food critic in New Orleans, uh, started right after the storm, maybe two weeks after, um, doing a daily listing of which restaurants were open and which weren't. It was called the New Orleans food list or daily food list or something like uh, that. New Orleans menu. Menu. Excuse huh. me. And and. This gave people incredible hope, and it wasn't just a practical thing for people who were there who needed to know where they could go eat. It was for displaced New Orleanians who could be in Seattle or be somewhere else and see that their city was coming back. And, and, yeah. and, and the list built every day, slowly but surely. It was, it was building, and, um, and, and he just started it on, on a whim and then realized that it had really become a lifeline to a lot of people. So it's like the, like the civic version of bulletins yeah. from somebody who's in the hospital who's sick. And How are they doing? And remember, this yeah. is what's but working. Who's, who's open? Mm -hmm. you know, who's this, coming back? This is what the culture's working. Like, the city government is ineffectual. The road home money's not arriving. Uh, the, um, the police can't arrest anybody for anything. Uh, the state attorney's office is turning anyone they do arrest loose. The school system isn't open. Um, nothing else that every all the bad stuff that we depicted in the wire in a previous show was just as bad or worse in new orleans and some of it was quite worse before the storm i mean it's one of the right. poor, you know it's one of the worst governed cities in america I, you know i can say that bluntly um but what works and works like an engine like a fierce <laughs> relentless engine, <laughs> is culture i mean you know yeah. people people come back to the city you know there are, there are no civic amenities other than you get to live in New Orleans and be a New Orleanian. Right. <laughs> and somewhere, somebody's having a parade on Sunday if you want it, and, and, and the food will not taste like it did in Houston, you know? Yeah. It, um, 
And that, that's, you know, that's the one thing that worked relentlessly. You see and that so with the, the the Wendell Pierce, that. with uh, Antoine's character, with music. Yeah. That he's almost like an addict. He's like a music addict. Yeah. He's out all hours of the day and night. There's actually an endurance test in this fifth season where he's yeah. like, what does he go for, 48 hours or something, right? Yeah, he's got to get yeah. his fix. Well, it's, it's, all, yeah, it's, it's also his, uh, I want to go back to just being a player. Right. You know, yeah. Yeah, uh, this responsibility stuff hurts. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. well, one other thing I'd say in terms of what Nina was noting, Tom Vismarsh did another thing after the storm. He had a radio show about food prior to it. And when he, when he got back on air, roughly a month or a couple of weeks after the show, all that he would talk about on a radio show was food, which ends up being incredibly helpful because although we all wanted to talk about how our insurance company was terrible, et cetera, et cetera, the idea we got this oasis to just talk about, you know, man, I went back to Dickie Brennan's Steakhouse to open again. They were really good. Right. Um, and I wondered about the extent <coughs> that, that kind of communal uh, of approach to food is possible in other places. It's a protected and, space, I guess. Yeah. And, I, I don't rejoice in the fact that New Orleans does it so well. I lament the fact that other places in the city that have great produce, have great tradition, have not attempted to, to make that part of their identity in a way that would be, um, be worthwhile for everyone. Yeah. Why the hell do I want to travel to Cleveland and eat bad New Orleans food or McDonald's? Yeah. You know, they gotta be something there worth eating. <laughs> That's true. I, if, I'd like to just switch up and have Nina tell the story of building uh, the exact replica of uh, Momofuku. The, the in, kitchens in season, yeah, season two. Yeah, this two. is a story New, New Yorkers have to hear. Uh, well, season <laughs> two was the tale of three kitchens. Right. And um, this is actually, it's actually how the cookbook kind of came about at the beginning was that we had a marketing meeting with HBO as we do every year. We talk about the upcoming season and try to get them excited about our show because they're, well, you know, they, they have a lot of other shows that they're working on besides ours. And um, so, so trying to get them excited about the upcoming season and talking about different themes. And I knew that David and Eric were gonna feature food heavily and Jeanette going to New York and, yeah. and, and everything. And so uh, they're saying, okay, you know, what else is going on this year? And I said, well, you know, and, and we're gonna have a cookbook. And, I didn't really think about what I was saying. I usually think before I speak, but this time I didn't. And, uh, and, and so I said, well, we're gonna have a cookbook. And then I got three emails from different departments at HBO by the next day saying, tell me more about this cookbook. This really sounds great, you know? So, so then that's, you know, we had, to, we had to follow through with the cookbook. But <laughs> after that, um, so I, I, yeah, totally made it up and Lola's, Lola's totally made it work. <laughs> But uh, drafted into service. <laughs> drafted into service. He didn't have much choice. But um, but but the tale of the, the three kitchens. We knew that Jeanette was going to go through this journey of <coughs> working in three New York kitchens, and so in the way that we often do of of combining fantasy with reality, we decided we'd put La Bernadette, where Eric Repair was gracious enough to let us shoot in his real kitchen yeah. on Sundays. Yeah. And his whole crew coming in on their only day off to work with us help Jeanette make the steak tartare. And, um, and, and, and that was quite an amazing experience. Um, but so we did that and then we had our two fictitious kitchens which were sets that we built, Brillard. Um, These being, were built in New Orleans, weren't we? We built yeah. them on a soundstage in New Orleans. So you're looking at New York but it's actually New Orleans? It's New Orleans. I mean Chester Kaczynski, our production designer and I came up uh, early in, in August and just did a tour of, of kitchens up here, you know, and tried to Try to see what we could, what we could figure out um, that would be good, and just just we wanted there to be a journey for for Jeanette. So we had to have three really different kinds of experiences, working with different chefs in different kinds of of settings. But when we got to Momofuku, we toured David Chang's a couple of his restaurants um, down here, and Chester built something which was very similar, and. Um, the, the treat of that was the first time David Chang came down. Yeah. I mean, it was a surreal experience for him just walking in. He's like, oh my God. It really, <laughs> like, it really does look like, like, it does look really like the, threw him. the front room of Momofuku. So. And then he said, I wonder how I could get six extra, extra inches in my kitchen. No, right. because he was jealous that we had all this space. He has his, um, his, all his prep kitchens are downstairs the way they are, I guess, in most New York kitchens, everything is kind of in the basement and everyone there has to be, you know, four feet tall or, or you know, hunchback <laughs> or something. It was a better, Amazing. we gave him a better kitchen. 
basically. Than we have we a better kid, but yeah. I, I mean, and I think we had the same experience that when the season was over. David and I and Eric came up and ate at Momofuku, and it was like walking on tour set in some way. It was very bizarre, but the food was much better. Are you actually? <laughs> are you actually? just building a restaurant? I mean, this is a different kind of show. This is not an illusion-based show. Things have to work, don't they? Um, sort of? Yes or, and no. We, yeah. I, we cooked everything out of a catering truck oh, outside of the okay. Deliver, Delivered it to we had a, we yeah. had a uh, Yeah, we, we, had, we had chefs out there working but, and bringing the food in. But the but, burners had to work and, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, but, you, know, you, you don't go overboard. You don't build the... Uh, you don't build the coat room, and you don't build the walk-in freezer, and you don't stock the walk-in freezer, <laughs> and you don't, you know. No, although the, uh, getting to season four, when Jeanette comes in and uh, takes over her, her new restaurant, um, actually, sorry, it's season three, the, the Feeney restaurant, yeah. we, the, the challenge was what, what would make her go into business with this guy, you know, and what would make her... Um, take over this space, which was hideously ugly, if you remember the beginning of that season. Yes. It was an awful space. But it had a couple of things that, that impressed her, or, or that, you know, according to Bourdain, would impress any chef. Right. And one was like a deck oven, which none of us knew what a deck oven was, but apparently <laughs> it's very impressive. We brought Susan Spicer through the kitchen along Shia <laughs> and a couple other people and said, would, would you cook in this space? It's hideous. I said, yeah. It was a deck Deco. <laughs> <laughs> and, and a fancy slicer. We bought a, a $6,000 slicer for Jeanette. Um, yeah, for the, like prosciutto and that right, kind of thing. Prosciutto, which yeah. we left in the space. And, and, and those, that's what sold her, besides Tim Feeney. Of course. But I, I will say this. When Tim David Feeney. Chase does a show for HBO with a restaurant in it, it will be a fully functioning restaurant. <laughs> and, and it will, you know, it'll be great. So. And the walk-in freezer has more than one use. It'll have, it'll have a wine cellar, and it will be stocked. <laughs> right. yeah, HBO has no idea how much money we actually save them. They have no idea. <laughs> you should tell them. I'm sure they'll uh, be very happy. <laughs> we'll get a memo off. <laughs> that was, uh, I think, I can, you can tell that story. First season, uh, we were, we were you know, Nina goes through this uh, shakedown cruise called First Season, where she breaks the crew in. And they, they learned to do things the uh, Nina Noble way. And there was, um, there was one moment where the, the, the prop master, or I think maybe then he was the assistant prop master, there was a bottle of... Very expensive wine. Uh, yes, a very expensive wine that, that was specific, speci right, specific to the script. And uh, he actually went out and got that wine. Aldo Conterno Barolo. Thank you. <laughs> that they drank without me out of paper cups. Right. Ladies well, and gentlemen, I was working with Philistines. Yeah. <laughs> we, we all finished that bottle, but there was this moment of Nina wanting, like half of Nina wanted to yell and go, you know, kid, you can put grape juice in it. You know, it's still going <laughs> to But the other part of Nina was like, all right, the guy's like, you know, he's trying to be authentic. Yeah. I got to respect this. So yeah. Nina, to authenticity. Yeah, I was, Nina well, was well, torn. I didn't know until he came over to Video Village and he's like, you know, I, I got this bottle. You guys want to drink it or what? Yeah. You know? <laughs> to which the answer was yes, but yes, after set. Of course. Um, the ultimate challenge with food on the show, I think, came in season four. And I, I'm not sure if the episodes aired, but I think, Alex, was that your episode with the omelet? Alex Hall, our hey, Alex. director's here from uh, episode 404, which I think is airing this weekend. Is that right? Two weeks. Two weeks, two weeks, yeah. excuse me. But after all this, we've talked about the choreography of the kitchen and where all the equipment is and getting the lines right and having actors learn to chop credibly and, and you know knowing all the lingo of the kitchen. So season four, we get this, this new challenge, which is to cook an omelet in real time. Now, people that are chefs, an omelet, it's a very simple thing, but it's the most elegant thing you can do in a kitchen. And um, so, De Sautel is gonna cook an omelet. So, the, the scene is written very ornate. I mean, Bourdain wrote great stuff, and I think you guys did very little to it, usually, once, mm -hmm. it was, once the scenes were trim. there. Trim, trim. Trim, but, but, you know, but, but in this case, he wrote an unusual detail, all the steps, to this omelet. But there was also a lot of dialogue in the scene. It was an important scene with Davis turning 40 and questioning where yeah. his life was going and everything. And so this was a scene where we didn't have the omelet plated in advance or provided 
by the backstage cooks. This was Kim actually cooking an omelet during, during the course of the scene and having to time out the dialogue with the movement in the kitchen and the omelet. I mean, you know, getting the burners just right so the eggs would only cook at a certain speed and, you know, it was, it was quite, quite masterful. I she, I, you know, I don't know, but it looked like she knew what she was doing. I mean, is she, is she credible as a, somebody in a kitchen or? I mean, she's can been, you even say that? Or? She's been a waiter. She's been a waitress because she's an actor in New York. So <laughs> There you go. <laughs> she, she volunteers that right away. She goes, well, you know, I've, I've worked the front of the house a lot. You know. But yeah. she, worked, she worked hard at it. She worked in craft in L.A. and in New York, you know, during off times. Wherever she was during the hiatus working on different shows, we would set her up with a kitchen. And then we had Susan Spicer with her. I mean, we, we knew right away there's things like chopping and just a couple of things that, that chefs do, but mostly knife skills that I think give it away. How, do you have any sort of standard protocol set up to teach actors how to do things at which they are supposed to be very good or even expert? Or does it just vary from person to person? Or do you have, you, you have a, a sequence in an upcoming episode where uh, Antoine is uh, teaching an actor how to pretend like he can play the trombone, which I thought was kind of a wonderful almost in joke. It was. Because Wendell Pierce, uh, well, I guess he could probably play a little bit. He's not a professional. No, that was us having fun with the meta of it. No, but, <laughs> but yeah. well, Wendell being the talented actor that every, in answer to your question, everyone had their own method, I think, and after a while figured out what worked. We'd always put them together with everything. <coughs> but Wendell, um, in interestingly, would be provided with a video of playing, and it's partly the nature of the trombone, and he would memorize the, the moves. So... It wasn't so much. I think he knew. Uh, Not just with the slide, but with the embouchure. Right. Uh, every everything. So he would be um, pantomiming basically at the beginning, and you know, as the seasons went on, I think he, his playing ability got better. But in, in the street, he would start blowing like the head of tunes because he he'd learned that much. You could hear, you know. He, but there's a very funny moment of, in one of the early seasons, he he has a gig in the horn section of an Alan Toussaint recording session, and it was really Alan Toussaint there. And at one point. In the rehearsal, they were going over the horn line, and he decided, "Well, I'm I'm with these five other great New Orleans session guys. I, I I would be remiss if I didn't, you know." So he let fly with a couple of notes, and there was this moment of Alan to say it from the booth, going, uh, "Wait a sec," <laughs> and, and just don't do that. Yeah, no, like <laughs> whatever that is. For, like he he looked up, he was like, you know, you know, Bob was it? No, no. And, and like Wendell's just trying to die, you know, <laughs> you know as, as it's slowly, you know, as slowly the eye of Alan Toussaint comes onto him and says, you know, what you were doing before, don't do it ever again, please. I want to, I want to ask you one more question uh, and then we'll open the floor to a Q and A from the audience. Uh, I have to know about the crab cakes because that, that was one of the funniest bits of business in the preceding seasons, the, 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 the business with the signature dish in, in uh, uh, Jeanette's restaurant, and, and it, I, everybody I've talked to who has been a chef or worked in a kitchen or anything recognized this idea of a signature dish that become, you become a slave the, the to it. Oh, no, ravioli. crawfish ravioli. Crawfish ravioli, that's yeah. right. Crawfish ravioli, and everybody who comes into the restaurant wants it. They're not ordering anything else, right? Right. It, what sort kitchen of comes to hate it, yeah. Yeah, what sort of reaction did you get from the community of chefs and restaurant people who watch Treme? Did they say, finally? Somebody they all got them. that, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think we tried to come up with obstacles for Jeanette. Yeah. That season was all about, you know, what can go wrong in the restaurant. So, you know, the thing we had, you know, waiters who didn't know how to serve table side with the, the rentier, and they're trying to serve it with two spoons, and it's dropping all over the place. And we had, we had the crawfish ravioli, and we had a couple other things that went wrong for her. Um, but crawfish all, ravioli probably. was actually a great motif because it put her in direct conflict with success yes which is a dish becomes signature mm -hmm. everybody wants it she's filling the restaurant with it she, it's killing her kitchen it's killing the creativity of the kitchen also uh crawfish season is going to come to an end and of course somebody uh, like her backer would, would say let's go get the frozen awesome. chinese right crawfish so but the other thing that was important to us is that her obstacles be culinary obstacles. Right. Because so often what happens in shows where there might be a kitchen featured is that the problem is the chef is having personal problems at home, right. which means that the writers who are not chefs are able to do it. Yes. So the idea of bringing somebody like Bourdain on 
And right. also having consultants like Susan Spicer was, we want to actually make these kitchen issues. She has personal problems as well, and we deal with those. Right. But the idea is, how do we make this true to what would be her main concern? Why would she Press walk? Why would she walk away from? Well, this becomes, you know, obviously the, the question of authenticity and and the, and the creative professional is so central to the show. But that, to me, almost seemed like a linchpin of so many of the things that you're talking about on the show. This idea of, in order to be a success, you have to be known for one thing and do it over and over again, and then it stops being about. Uh, the ravioli and and uh, people come to eat it just to say that they have eaten it maybe it doesn't even matter if it's good or right not after a certain point yeah but also um new orleans is not a museum um and it's often mistaken for such musically and uh you know the, the things that are happening there that everyone's talking about are not uh the same dish that's prepared the same way as it was 100 years ago they'll talk about that and they'll honor that but at the same time there's always somebody somewhere that is trying to twist the not differently, and, do, and that's true musically, and it, it's, you know, um, th there are so many different uh, uh, musical paths that are that are that are active right now that are actually, um, uh, you know, music being made now that you wouldn't have heard three years ago or four years ago in New Orleans, and the same is true at, at some of the better places in New Orleans in the cuisine, and that was a reason to bring her to New York because, you know. Uh, you know, as you, you were talking about the competition between New Orleans and New York, I don't think New York knows that there's any competition between, you know. <laughs> yeah. But New Orleans, like, like any other, you know, sort of uh, regional or second tier city is going to look to New York and have a chip on its shoulder. And at the same time, there's no arguing with what, that New York is, the, is, is this, you know, this uh, focal point of, of aggressively changing culture. You know, same thing true musically, you know, there, there's probably two one and a half, two venues for modern jazz in all of New Orleans um, that, that are strictly, you know, it's, it's if, you, if you're playing modern jazz, you, you're, you're playing elsewhere probably for your career. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a lot of great people have to leave New Orleans in order to be found. And so that, that's the sort of second season exile was important for that reason. So we're going to open the floor to questions. Actually, the floor. We have a microphone right there. If anybody wants to ask anything, you just uh, step up <coughs> and uh, we'll do our best to answer you. Hi. Um, first of all, kudos on such an amazing and authentic show. Thank um, you. But what I'm really curious about is how did you get such big name chefs to be a part of the, the show and participate and, you know, help you write the restaurant scenes and all that? It started with Bourdain. Um, I was an admirer of Bourdain's writing, um, just his prose writing, as I'm sure a lot of people are. He's, he's, a, he's a very adept storyteller. Uh, and I'd also fallen in love with, uh, you know, I, I sat there like a lot of you have uh, on that Labor Day weekend when, when the travel uh, channel shows all of the without no reservations over and over. I was there with my son, you know, through about 12 of them, you know, uh, you know still in our pajamas, not it's shaved. It's parts unknown now. Yeah. I used to work for CNN. <laughs> and so at some point, my wife said to me, she said, you know, if you're really going to do this restaurant thing, you probably should go get somebody like Bourdain. So I cold called him. I, I'd met him once before when he wrote a mystery novel. I'd met him in England uh, because my, my wife's a mystery novelist. And, um, but I didn't expect him to remember that, but I cold called him and we went to lunch here in New York. Um, and uh, I sort of sounded him out on what, what, what we should go for in the show. And, and after that, I had an idea that maybe, you know, he would write for it after that lunch. That lunch was also a spectacle of me making an idiot of myself. It was at, um, it was at that really good sushi place over on 43rd, near 3rd, uh, Yazawa? Yasuda, right. And, uh, and, you know, my wife, I'm so busy pitching to, to Bourdain that I'm, I'm not paying attention to what I'm doing with the food. I'm really not paying attention because I can't do two things at once. And my wife is watching and doing everything that Bourdain does because that's who she is. So he's like not using any soy sauce and he's just you know, popping them in his mouth with his fingers and making sure that he eats it like 15 seconds after it's put in front of him and, you know, nodding to the chef at the appropriate moments. And, and I'm like drowning it in soy sauce, and, <laughs> and I'm spilling stuff, and you know, and my and, and my wife's giving little tiny shakes of her head, like, <laughs> stop, just stop. But I can't, you know, and and uh, so I think he left thinking he was really going to work for 
you know, just a disastrous. <laughs> and, but, but, you know, then he turned in this long memo of what should happen and what, what should be at stake for the chef. And at that point, you know, it was all I could do to, to just beg him to help us write, write the thing. And then, you know, once you get Bourdain, you're, you're in, you know, and then it's just a matter of him calling up his frat, frat boy chef brothers and, you know, and it was all game on, you know. To say that David Chang often was flying in from Australia and other places to come and spend one day on our set. And that, that was incredible. I mean, and he, and he not only helped with the food and with everything else at uh, Lucky Peach, he would help me with the extras. You know, that it was hard to find extras that belonged at Lucky Peach in New Orleans. It's like, you know, these people look like they'd be at your restaurant. Well, no, not really. No. Change his jacket. You know. It's actually his playlist of rock and roll that's, yeah. that, that's in the restaurant. That's right. Can you say uh, if there are any aspects of these restaurant storylines that are, that are the experts exercising their own demons? Do, they, do you ever get into that? Do you even ask where these, where these stories come from? Or, I mean, is it a, a lot particular of, detail? Of I, I, I mean, in, in seeing a lot of, of, of Bourdain's writing and in, and in some of the stuff he covered with Chang and, and, and uh, repair. And repair. You know, it's stuff that comes up in his interviews of them and in, in his TV work with them. So, I mean, he was, he was you know, he wrote this thing for, um, you know, he was not particularly enamored of Emerald for many, many years, and, 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 and he let Emerald have it with both barrels. But he wrote that, that wonderful hmm. soliloquy that Emerald delivers about how, you know, he, he, he gave Emerald his due and said, you know, once you get the flagship restaurant up and, the, and you're basically, um, it's this big ship yeah. that, that it, you know, it needs to make port and everybody's relying on you to make port and, you know, you got to keep it going. And, you know, you, you know, there's one thing to be said, I'm going to make my little boutique food in my, with 20 tables and I'm just going to do what I want to do and, and I'm going to change the menu every night and, and be totally creative. And, you know, that, the other side of, of what, uh, what Kim Dickens' character needed is Emeril saying, you know, I'm, I'm running a business here and, and people depend on me. And I got to do that, you know, and there's a challenge to doing good food, you know, that, that you can't change the menu on a dime. You can't turn it on a dime. And so he wrote that for Emeril. And it was almost, and I think for, for, for Bourdain, it was a little bit of an apology <laughs> of like, not, I, I'm, now I'm going to see it from your side. And, he, and, he, and he, he actually called Emeril and said, um, just do the scene. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, even before I, he, we showed him the page, he goes, he goes, I'm writing something for you. Which, if you, if you know their history, was, it's kind of a beautiful thing. Yeah. Also, if you Google Dan Barber and listen to your fish, you'll get some sense of the origin. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> listen to your fish. Yeah. So, Chef, this is for you. Um, um, you just said, um, what's at stake for the, the chef, what they're cooking. Now, you were talking earlier about your mom's gumbo. Your mom's gumbo is better than everybody else's mom's gumbo. And I'm from Brooklyn, and you know, your mom's gravy, I saw my mom make gravy <laughs> on Sundays, and so somebody <coughs> said, oh, your gravy's really good. How, you know, what do you put in it? And I always leave like one, possibly three things out of it, <laughs> so that, my gravy's always better than theirs. So, you know, you made a cookbook. What did you leave out of your mom's gumbo? If you will, chef, respectively. He's got you. Oh, man. It's funny you ask that question, because there is a real answer to that question, which is in many ways unbelievable. But it gets vindicated at the end. Um, you know, the folks who will say, well, you know, gumbo's whatever you have in the refrigerator. You just put everything, and I'm like, no, that ain't it. In fact, my mother used to talk about, you know, she didn't like poor man's gumbo, meaning if, if you cannot afford to make a decent pot of gumbo, then make something else. <laughs> but there was one, one thing, garlic bologna. And they used to sell it like you could buy a pound of it. You can't do that anymore, but you can go and they'll have it sliceable. And so what she would do is say, don't slice it, give me a one pound piece. And mind you, this is the antithesis of everything I pretend to stand for culinarily. You know, man, I don't want all that <laughs> processed stuff. I want it to be for real. But my mother puts that in her gumbo, and she doesn't put wieners in a gumbo or chicken necks, all the rest of that stuff I disdain. 
But I got some vindication. One of my dearest friends in the world, um, a guy named Rich Hemphill, tasted my mother's gumbo. And he said, man, what was that other thing they had? Not the sausage, but that other thing. I'm like, you know, in that sense, what's most important is the chef's taste and the chef's discernment. So if you take the gumbo recipe in the book and go to the deli and buy some garlic bologna and slice it in there, you'll be all right. <laughs> Many things I'd like to say. I want to thank you for the wire. I'm still in shock that it's over. But I, that, it was so brilliant. And then I thought, well, what is he going to do next? And you did this. Now, I've been to New Orleans 35, 40 times in my life. I, I, I connect. It, it, the place moves me. And you, you guys are spot on. It's just so beautiful what's happening. It's very and, kind. I'm so sorry that it has to, you know, it's coming to an end. All good things come to an end. But there's, you, there's this insistence on having viewers. That right. I find, I well, I find to be repulsive and and, yeah. and disconcerting. Uh, you know? I hear you. But it's, it's, you really, I think what uh, you've created here, it's a gift. You've given uh, the people of New Orleans and the country. And I think a lot of people are going to wake up, you know, down the road and say, oh, my God, I miss this. But uh, also... What you pulled off with the New York chefs, brilliant. Um, you know, there's nuances and all kinds of subtle things. I know all those guys, and uh, I just, I, I couldn't about, believe it. How it about was, Alan Richmond? Yeah, Alan Take, Richmond too, Sazerac right. Taking the to the face. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right, that's right. I mean, let's yeah. give some respect to Alan Richmond for, for so, being willing to I expect the, the greatest joke. hits real. Uh, when I'm eating your mom's gumbo because I want I can't wait to get back to New Orleans I had the privilege of meeting Alan Toussaint a couple of times so that story really uh, connects and it's a great place and thank you so much for Tremé I just like to echo what the last gentleman said and also um, a homemade gumbo aside specifically Specifically, which restaurants and or dishes are not to be missed in New Orleans? What's in the Pantheon? Oh, gosh. No, no, no. I'm so sorry. You thought you were going to get through. Whoever you leave out, out will hear about it. <laughs> Whoever I leave out. Yeah. 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 You know, and the drag is like, um, it's not as if you can't get a bad meal in New Orleans. I've had a lot of them, but so, so many things. We were talking earlier about all the Brennan's restaurants, the whole extended family has great bread pudding. Um, for gumbo, I like um, I like what they're doing at uh, at Dickie Brent at um, Palace Cafe. I like what um, Frank Brighton does, etc. Um, what else? What else? What else? Well, Y'all got favorite dishes as well. Um, <laughs> take get in the car, drive the 40 minutes, go to Mosca's, have the chicken a la grande, uh, and uh, and the uh, oysters Mosca, mm. and and also the shrimp dish and. <laughs> And the sausage. There's, there's, such, there's such incredible pride in food in New Orleans everywhere. I mean, there's a guy, um, Bingo, that cooks outside a Bullet Sports Bar. And, um, and, and I mean, and he really cares if you like his food or not. He'll say, you know, was it good? Did you like it? And, and, and that's the thing in New Orleans. I've never been asked that question so often by people who really care mm -hmm. whether, whether you like it or not. And that's from street food yeah. to, to high-end dining. Yeah. Um, it's remarkable. Um, yeah, I will say this. They do one thing. I'm from Baltimore. They do one thing wrong. And I'm willing to go there. <laughs> and I've proven it. We've proven it with our crew. We've, we've proven, proven it. it. Um, yeah. We've proven it. Well, it's empirical. Um, <laughs> they, they boil their crabs. They boil their blue crabs. And so they, it takes the taste of the boil. And it overwhelms blue crab, which is a very subtle. <laughs> so every year, every year for well, our last... They put sausage and potato and everything else in the Yeah, yeah, boil, but, but so. you basically are tasting the boil. Right. So for three years, the last three years of the crew, and the crew was this wonderful uh, meld of two-thirds New Orleans, one-third Baltimore. And New York. Yeah, and some New York. But, but, but there was a hard Baltimore contingent that understood what, you know, they, don't, they, they can't do much to beat New Orleans anywhere else, but they understand the blue crab. And, uh, and we, would, we would have so many bushels of steamed and so many bushels of boiled, and every time, boiled leftover, steam, 
every last crap uh, gone. <laughs> well, I would yes, like there to... were more con converts to Steam than there were the other way around. But what I would do, they'd always save me some of the crab, and what I'd do is make Mar Maryland crab soup at the end, and everybody would drink it. We'd bring it to craft service, and we'd bring it to the office and everything, and then that would be our communion of the two cultures. That's and everybody right. would eat the soup and all get along and at least for a I'd day. I'd like to say I voted for steam crab as if my job depended on it. Oh. <laughs> it was secret ballot. <laughs> Uh-oh. Hi, Lolis. Home girl. How you doing? Well. <laughs> How your mom in there? They good, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Simon, it's, I'm, I'm a big fan. Such a pleasure. Um, a, a couple of things. One, just um, myself and the other New Orleans expats who live here, um, you know, I remember the first episodes of the show, and I really couldn't tell you what was happening story-wise because we thought that you got the tone of the city so right in a way that I'd never seen captured before and um, we were so struck with homesickness, like there was a collective homesickness stretching from the Bronx to Brooklyn and we were all texting together, so thank you for that. Um, but in terms of the food and the, and, the, and, and the exploration of food that you've done, the one thing that mystifies me is I can find a lot of things here that can sort of approximate, you know what I mean. Why can't they get the French bread right? <laughs> what what is what? it? With, why can't I get it? Why can't I get a pope? Like, I refuse to eat anything that's labeled Creole or Cajun north of Baton Rouge, but <laughs> they can fry an oyster smart. here. But in spite of the fact that there's a million French bakeries in this city, I can't get French bread. That's New Orleans <laughs> French bread, and I've been waiting for you guys to address that on the show, but it hadn't happened. But <laughs> 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 I'm just sort of just curious about like you, know, these, you do these explorations. I just okay. That was season five. Well, season five was got the bread. The <laughs> There's the long arc. Yeah, I mean, there is a, there literally is an essay in the book about New Orleans French bread. Um, I'll never forget this friend of mine who went to France and said, you know, and the French bread was almost good as New Orleans. <laughs> <laughs> if you go to Leidenheimer Bakery in New Orleans, this is the place that supplies most of the French bread to most of the restaurants. Sandy Wine will tell you that he will give you the recipe. And if I remember correctly, the recipe is written down there. And his notion is that you cannot replicate it. He doesn't say that in an egotistical way, like you're not smart enough to do it. Um, one of the theories is that it's the water, uh, you know, the, the ambient yeast in New Orleans. The other aspect of it um, is that for you, with that very specific taste, New Orleans French bread is artisan bread, meaning it is something that only a master can do. But in terms of what that is, a very light, airy, white bread, it ain't artisan in the context of what other serious bakers are trying to do. And so the other issue is that how many people are trying to replicate that bread? What they're trying to do is get back to the old breads of Europe. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm not certain that uh, folks know what they're missing. You just reminded me of a great New Orleans-centric story, which is, and we played it for laughs in the show, but we played it with, a, uh, with um, Chief Lambroke doing it with a wink, but it wasn't done with a wink, which is uh, they took Big Chief Tootie Montana to the, uh, uh, to the Natural History Museum here in New York, I believe, and they were showing him the ceremonial masks from West Africa, which were very, very comparable in style to uh, the Mardi Gras masking uh, of, of the Mardi Gras Indians. And he took one look around, gave a little bit of a nod and said, they got that from us. <laughs> <laughs> it's a true story. It's a true story. Yeah, gonna, don't ever think for a minute New Orleans isn't the center of the universe. <laughs> we're going to take these two more questions, and we have to wrap up. So. Uh, thank you guys so much. The show is amazing. Uh, I'm also a huge fan of The Wire. And uh, a Marylander, so amen to steamed crabs. <laughs> um, you guys talked a lot about authenticity. Uh, and I'm interested in um, how your show has been. I mean, I have family in New Orleans. I go there a lot. It seems like a very authentic show to me, um, you know, tr pretty truly representative of people in New Orleans. Uh, how has it been received in, in New Orleans, and what do, what do people from New Orleans think? Or do they you know, think You know, it's, it's a southern city, and it's very polite, and so I think the people who don't enjoy the show um, 
probably don't come up to you and tell you so the, the same way they might in, say, Brooklyn. Um, <laughs> it, I'm really, very serious about that. Uh, you know, most people are, but I would say there are a lot of people, because it is a city that is very, very aggressively uh, argumentative and passionate about what is real and what is not, uh, we have, uh, at points, uh, started arguments we didn't mean to start. We've disappointed people. Um, we have included things that mattered, we thought, to us, but uh, other things that we, and, and no story can be about everything. You know, we've, we, got, we had 36 hours. Uh, even if we'd have gotten a little bit more, we would have left so much of New Orleans on the table. And again, we were, we were focusing on culture bearers. Those are our characters. So if you happen to be a dentist from Lakeview, you know, we didn't touch upon a lot of your post-Katrina experiences, which were, which were incredibly traumatic and, and, and as vibrant and as real as, you know, I guess what I'm saying is we never would claim, I would never claim that The Wire was, was the story of Baltimore. It was the story of a specific dynamic in, in that sort of the other America. And I would never claim that Treme is the story of all of New Orleans after, you know, it is not. It, it's, it's the story of these characters doing these things. And, and so I was conscious of that, but I think, you know, you land with that sort of big foot of being the HBO show that's, that says it's about this period of time in this place. And I think, you know, you can hurt people's feelings. Um, so the one thing I've tried to say over and over again for the last four years is, you know, it's not the only narrative about post-Katrina in New Orleans, nor should it be. Um, and that's really important to say. So, I mean, I think, you know, I've, I've short sold it that, you know, people watch it in bars and they, you know, we've heard a lot of nice things from a lot of people, but I don't think, you know, I would certainly not say it's universally loved. I think there's a lot of pride, though, in, in New Orleans about the show. I think it, it took us a while to gain people's trust. There were a couple shows, well, several, most of the things filmed in New Orleans about New Orleanians are not authentic. Um, so you don't have any any so voodoo. You don't have any chickens. Well, we did sacrifice one no, chicken, but that's that true. Was, yeah, we only filmed once on Bourbon Street. Right, right. You know, we're not but, there that much. And yeah, and that was us just letting Coco Robichaux be Coco Robichaux. So. But you have avoided a good many of the cinematic cliches of New Orleans. Well, we tried. Yeah. Um, you know, but but you know, we also played with them. We also had fun with them in some ways. Yeah. But the most interesting stuff in New Orleans is not the cliches. And one of the things that we did in terms of of I think why a lot of people liked it is that we tried to look at different areas and different aspects of the city. So even though we didn't do the dentist in Lakeview, there's a wide range of people we tried to bring together. And Wendell Pierce said something on a panel not unlike this about people telling him that they've introduced, we've introduced them New Orleanians, other aspects of the city. So folks who'd never seen the Mardi Gras Indians, the folks who had never been on St. Charles Avenue for Carnival. And that was one of the advantage of, of sort of coming in from the outside, the sense that all of it interested us, and how do we boil it down? When the episode in the first season that David and Eric wrote was really a tour of all these different carnivals, because most people don't even realize that there's a lot of different things going on simultaneously, and many of these people never encounter each other on that, on that great day. Mm -hmm. Last question. Guys, first of all, I'm a huge fan. Thank you guys for coming tonight. Um, I do have a quick question. As a first-generation American, I connect very well with Treme because of the fact that you know you identify yourself very profusely with the food, the culture, who you are. You stick to it, and I think this is very unique. Um, New Orleans in the United States, you know, a lot of other cities are constantly changing and moving around, but New Orleans constantly stays uh, the same in terms of its music and its food. And one of the things that my friends and I always talk about is that you know we're the first generation here, but by generation two, three, or four. We're going to become very Americanized and lose who we are in terms of our music, our food, our language. Do you think after Katrina and everything that's been going on that that may actually happen to New Orleans? You may start becoming more cultural with everything else as opposed to being the, one of the few cities in the U.S. that is uniquely amazing? I think it's going to change because all things change. Some of those changes, some, some things are going to be lost because some things get lost as, as, as cultures assimilate. And there are a lot of new people uh, down in New Orleans since the storm. Um, and how much they're assimilated into the culture and how much their culture uh, is layered on top is, is an open question. But that's not always a bad thing. You know, one of the things that, one of the dynamics that happened after the storm was a lot of uh, Latino um, construction workers came in. And you started hearing 
uh, and seeing um, uh, and tasting uh, cultures that weren't strongly represented in New Orleans, you know, I, it's only a matter of time before uh, there's a social aid and pleasure club that's, you know, <laughs> playing playing hard hard funk mariachi music. <laughs> I, I'm serious. I mean, it's going to happen, and it's going to be great, and it's going to it's it and and people will take that taste and they'll make it part of New Orleans. Some of the stuff, it's good. It's that it's it's good that it 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 it, it acquires different stuff. And just one thing I want to add, if you listen to a lot of the music from the Caribbean, Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, uh, Trinidad, it sounds very familiar to the music you listen to in New Orleans, but because of the cultural divide, you never... Well, the Spanish actually, tinge. Um, the, yeah. uh, that, that, um, God, I'm not, I'm not a good enough musician to, what? Jelly Roll Morton. Yeah. I mean, that, 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 that sort of uh, rumba, um, you hear it with like a 135 bass line, yeah. you know, Professor Longhair's left hand. You know, a lot of that is Cuba. A lot of that's from Cuba. Well, when we were talking about Nelson Hidalgo earlier and the idea of this, you know, arch capitalist coming to New Orleans and suddenly find himself enjoying the culture and not being so arch after it all, that is a microcosm of the actual history of New Orleans. Because after the American purchase in 1803, all these Americans came down there and said, you know, the French weren't smart enough to figure out how to make Louisiana a profitable colony. We're going to come down and do that. We're going to prove that this can be done. <coughs> well, modern carnival was started in 1868 by a bunch of guys from Alabama, among those Americans who had come to sort of civilize New Orleans. What did they do? They found the carnival tradition. And then fast forward to the, um, when the oil thing is getting bigger and bigger in the 70s and 80s, these same former Alabamians are saying that the Texans cannot join their carnival crews because they're not New Orleanian enough. <laughs> right. New Orleans, that, that's actually, it's a good note to end on because New Orleans actually has a long history of, of isolating itself almost willfully from whatever the new money is. You know, it's really a fascinating dynamic and it goes back to cotton money. You know, when, when the American cotton barons came down from the Delta and were like, hi, we're here, we're rich, we're ready to, you know, spread the wealth on your town and make it, uh, you know, the French sneered at them and, and wouldn't sell them uh, in the old town. And so that's the Garden District. That's all those mansions built uptown outside of New Orleans proper um, because they didn't, you know, that's, this was new money trash. And then those same cotton barons, uh, you know, fast forward to the, to, to, to the days of Rockefeller when oil money mattered. Um, they wouldn't let them join um, because that was new money trash. And then at some point when banking and, and commerce became, you know, this sort of fundamental and you were having regional banking centers, how did New Orleans go from being, you know, the second largest port in the United States to being, you know, all the tech, all the oil stuff went to Houston where they would let them be part of society. All the banking went to Atlanta. You know, New Orleans has a long tradition of saying no to prosperity, which is, which is, <laughs> but saying yes to tradition. It's not always the, the there haven't always been the best civic decisions, you know, if you read the business page, but, but it has preserved um, this peculiar place. A friend of mine, a late poet named Tom Dent, lived in New Orleans in Atlanta, and he said, in New Orleans, you'd be on your way to work, There'd be a second line parade on the street you need to go on. So what would you do? You get out of your car, you join the parade. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody would ever do that in Atlanta. Well, or as as Arnie said, you, I'm from Texas. You all, you, what was his line about you, the work? Uh, uh, yeah, you, you have a defective work ethic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> one of my favorites. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, but for a book, a book on the a great book on the history of New Orleans, it gets a lot of it in there. Is the book on the 27th flood by? There's a lot of great books on New John Orleans, Barry. but. But he really got the essence of saying no to saying no to prosperity is almost a condition of, of, <laughs> of being in New Orleans. Uh, he, uh, John Barry's uh, Rising Tide. So I hope the rest of you tonight, if you if you have a drink later, you'll uh, perhaps propose a toast to um, uh, saying no to prosperity, <laughs> because it has uh, brought us New Orleans. And and I also want to thank our panel. <laughs> I want to thank our panel for giving so generously of their time tonight. <coughs> thank you. And, and, and their talent and their singular vision, which is, uh, I think, the, the unusual nature of the show will only become more apparent as we get a little distance from it. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.